Salam, hello, bonjour, welcome to the Majlis. I'm Adnan Hussein, your host and director of the Muslim Society's Global Perspectives Project. And with me today is a guest co-host. I'm delighted to welcome a literary scholar and friend from the English department at the University of Buffalo, Dr. David Schmidt. David, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Happy to be here. Oh, indeed. I'm so glad you could participate in today's uh, upcoming conversation about the life and the work of uh, the late Edward Said, a Palestinian American professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say one of the great intellectual figures of the later 20th century who's had a huge impact on this century as well. He was not only a remarkable literary scholar and a foundational figure in post-colonial scholarship, but he was also a public intellectual whose essays and commentary in media ranged across music, film, cultural topics, all the way to international affairs and politics. I can't myself, for example, think of four more significant books on different subjects and fields written in such a short period as Orientalism, The Question of Palestine, Covering Islam, and The World, The Text, and The Critic. Um, I think especially at the present moment, we're really conscious of how important his voice was and has been for the cause of Palestine. And I certainly have missed that unique, um, urbane, very over the nearly two decades since he died at the age of 67 to leukemia. We are nevertheless really fortunate that a new intellectual biography has recently been published, an account of his life and thought entitled Places of Mind, A Life of Edward Said. And um, I think it's just a wonderfully evocative study that recalls that remarkable voice in its many facets. Its author is Dr. Timothy Brennan, who is Samuel Russell Chair in the Humanities and Professor of Comparative Literature and English at the University of Minnesota. And he was a student, colleague, and friend of Edward Said, and he joins us today. Tim, welcome, and thank you for making the time to discuss your book with David and me. Of course. Thank you for having me. So, um, Tim, if I could, I'd like to begin by asking you a question about the, the origins and the motivation for writing the book. Um, when you were setting out to uh, begin work on, on this book, were you, um, what was your general aim? I mean, for example, were you conscious of wanting to correct certain misperceptions or uh, misconceptions of Saeed and his work? And, and if so, you know, what were those and how did you set about addressing them? I, I kind of internalized Edward's lesson like many of us uh, in, in my generation had. And so I felt that my own projects were already imbued with several of his ideas and I saw the work that was wholly my own as being something that was trying very consciously to expand on and deepen some of the leads I got from him. And I also had written 13 or so essays on Edward, um, some of them written while he was still alive. So um, it wasn't in that sense too much of a shift. However, I never would have thought of writing a biography, certainly not one for a commercial press where I had to uh, take on the, the, the task of trying to explain often very difficult literary theories uh, to all of the people who read Edward and who care about Edward, which includes Palestinian revolutionaries and uh, Middle East uh, area studies uh, specialists and, and uh, journalists. So I, um, I didn't take it on lightly, but I also didn't um, initiate the move. I was actually called by Edward's former literary agent, Andrew Wiley uh, mm -hmm. from New York, who had tested the waters and found that there was significant interest among commercial publishers in New York for a biography, an intellectual biography. It was, it was always told to me at the beginning that that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, if I don't do it, somebody else will. Uh, I care about his legacy. Um, I will drop what I'm doing and take this on, even though I wasn't sure that I could pull it off. I didn't know I could write a biography. So. Um, that's, that's how it began. And then, you know, from there, I think it was a job of getting his family on board. Um, mm -hmm. There were a lot of attempts to uh, blacken the name of Edward, uh, so that there were researchers at various times working for a commentary or the New Republic 
uh, uh, magazines hostile to Edward, uh, pro-Zionist uh, magazines. And so a lot of people who knew him were wary about talking to people. So I was fortunate in having uh, them on my side and, and uh, the word sort of spread that it's okay to talk to him, you know? So that along with the archives, the FBI files, uh, but more than anything, access to people who grew up with him, who knew him or part of his family was, uh, you know, it allowed me to, to fill in the gaps and to actually write something that wasn't only about his ideas. You know, it's, it's also, you can't write an intellectual biography of a man like this without a lot of personal anecdotes and vignettes and things that sort of bring his character to life because his public performance of himself and of his ideas is at least as important as the ideas themselves. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, well, firstly, you did a wonderful job for a first attempt at a biography. I mean, it's, it reads wonderfully and it really evokes him. But, you know, I think since it is really an intellectual biography, you try and put into conversation his life and his works and ideas. And so I was wondering what you thought were some of the best examples of the relationship between those two things, where the insights of knowing about his life really informed understanding his work in a new way, or uh, likewise, how his work affected or had consequences on his life, which I'm sure, you know, having written polemical you know, treatises, uh, you know, political work, radical work would, would have that effect. I'm wondering what, what were some of the kinds of examples that best illustrate that dynamic for you? Right. Um, there are a number of people who, of course, knew Edward personally, who were really driven more than anything by the charm of his persona. It's it's uh, something that those of us who knew him personally could not get over, and I think it was a big big part of his reputation and his uh, success. So, you know, you you must, no matter what you do, when you write about Edward, if you're writing about his life, even his intellectual life, you you have to capture to a certain extent his sense of humor, the uh, imperiousness with which he would. Uh, make de demands of the people close to him, the way he would immediately shift, you know, from uh, an emotional register of intense anger to uh, having forgotten all about it a minute later. You know, th there was kind of an old womanish side of him, right, where he would harangue and, and bicker, and then suddenly he'd drop it and he'd be completely different. So, you know, this, this person in the world uh, is a very important thing uh, uh, in the story of Edward. But I think that in, in a way, it's a danger. Maybe, maybe I could say even it's a dangerous allure to concentrate exclusively on that because his legacy has everything to do with the importance of the intellectual in the in, in American life, but also in, in world life. I think that this was probably his greatest lesson to the people in the Middle East, that intellectuals matter, that culture is a very, very important aspect of political persuasion and uh, political policy making. So in, in order to really tell his story, you, you've got to somehow explain how a literary critic who is involved in rather complex philosophical uh, you know, investigations of language um, didn't sort of overcome that at a certain point in his career in order to turn outwards and become a political personality who would debate the likes of Gene Kirkpatrick on the nightly news. You know, it's, it isn't like those two things are separated. The one directly is related to the other. And in every one of these major books that you kindly mentioned, yeah. he's making the point that certain literary critical concepts like narrative or representation, um, these have political consequences. Moreover, they trained him they created him as the intellectual that he was. So he, as the way he saw it, uh, the kind of low wattage intellectual level of American public discourse needed an infusion of a more complicated kind of discussion that was happening in continental Europe. And he brought that into the American Academy. And he did it very consciously. And he did it in part at the beckoning of his mentors as an undergraduate, R.P. Blackmer, and also uh, his uh, graduate uh, co-dissertation uh, uh, director, Harry Levin. And so I, th I think that he, this is, these two things are intimately connected, not only in his own mind about what he was doing, but I think in actuality. And so I wanted to show 
that these earlier ideas have everything to do with how he had the rhetorical ability to do what he did later in life. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, we're going to want to talk maybe a little more about that relationship between literary study, words, language, and um, his politics. But uh, I also had a question just about the title. Um, you called it Places of Mind, and to me it uh, really evoked Edward Said's own 1999 autobiography, Out of Place. Um, and I was wondering, um, what were you trying to signify with that? And I also think that that autobiography is really interesting. And I noticed that there were many ways in which you're both celebrating his self understanding and portrayal in that 1999 um, autobiography, but also uh, putting that juxtaposing that with other people's memories where he had a very particular portrayal and representation of his childhood, his family, for instance. Um, so what were you trying to get at in some ways with your title and in the relationship with his autobiography? A couple of things. One of them is that Edward had made a point to those who read him closely, really throughout his life, so he did this consistently, that whereas many of the people on the intellectual left and part of the Marxist tradition were primarily focused on questions of, of history, and therefore on questions of temporality, that he was much more persuaded by those who were motivated primarily by geography. And by that, he meant not only actual geographic territories, because in the end, as he pointed out in culture and imperialism, imperialism itself, the colonial project is about square footage. It's about how many acres of land you dominate. There's only so much land, it's finite. And so, um, he, that's one reason, but it's more than that. He, he talked a lot in Orientalism, for example, but not only there, of the geographic imagination. So it, it, it's, it's a rather complex issue. I don't want to get too deeply into it, maybe at this point in our conversation, but there was a turn going on in the literary theory circles of his own day, yeah. away from history and towards spatiality. And in and, and, and that milieu, it was really kind of a politically conservative gesture. It was saying, we don't need to think about the recovery of the past as a past that actually happened, because we all know that it's merely narrativized and therefore it's fictional. And therefore, you know, it's all a question of what you invent, this mm -hmm. kind of notion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, let's talk instead about the archaeology of knowledge, right? A kind of seeing knowledge as a cross section. So there's a kind of static image there of things that can be pondered, you know, there's a thingliness to it, which gets, a, gets away from this vital notion of historical agents actively involved in ideas and disseminating notions in order to create influence, you know, th this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so he was turning that whole, you know, gesture towards spatiality on its head by trying to say, no, let's, let's indeed talk about geography. Let's talk about space in this degree. But let's bring it back to a worldliness. Let's bring it back to the notion of actual, the actual conquest of territory. Mm -hmm. So that is one reason why I wanted to invoke in the title of this biography, the term place, because it gestures to this very, very important move that he made throughout his life away from temporality towards geography. There, there is another reason, and that is that I think the tragedy of the Palestinian experience, and one of the things that makes people who do not live in Palestine authentic as Palestinians, is that they have to project onto a territory that is in, in many ways largely imaginary, mm -hmm. because there is no right of return. Uh, those who have been forced out cannot go back and become a part of it, even if they want to. So uh, this is, this is, I think, the motif that he really successfully evokes in his uh, photo text collage with Jean Moore after The Last Sky, which is him sort of, you know, emotionally reminiscing, but also projecting upon these photos, wonderful photos taken in the occupied territories of Palestine by Jean Moore. Um, and many people who know the the territories uh, often like to point out that Edward got it wrong, that he often misunderstands what's going on in these photos. And I think that they miss the point, not Edward, that Edward knows that he probably gets it wrong because he's not there. 
and that this is what one is reduced to. So there's a, there's a distinction between an actual place that one occupies and where one's mind is in regard to the place that matters to one. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to evoke in that image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I, I had a kind of a follow up question about uh, your head note, which I thought was really striking. This quote that reads, not as harmony and resolution, but as intransigence, difficulty and unresolved contradiction, which is taken from Said's uh, On Late Style. And I think one of the reasons it was striking to me is because, in a sense, you would imagine that the genre of the intellectual biography is um, always potentially about a gesture of harmony or synthesis or unity and you seem um through your choice of head note to be indicating to the reader of your book that that's not perhaps uh, where you're going in places of mind could you say a little bit more about why you chose that head note edward loved to rail against uh finished systems of thought mm. and I think that he's worried about a couple of things when he rails against that. And he sees this gesturing towards irresolution uh, as, as one of you know, the, the many ways in which he had sort of spoken about his, his, his uh, not only lack of interest in, but also his, his, uh, his, his, his fearfulness and caution towards people who have systems of thought. For one thing, a lot of the theorists of the day, you know, people who were drawn to Foucault's discourse or Derridian deconstruction or the, or the Marxists who wanted to uh, see that a political economy was the answer to all questions of culture and, and these kinds of things. He, I think he, he looked at those and he thought that this is way too easy and it's way too formulaic and it becomes a skeleton key that opens all locks. And that mm. is just the opposite of what it means to be an intellectual. So he's trying to convey, I think, in this kind of statement that we should be critical not only of the obvious targets of our ire, right? The governments of the United States, let's say, or the, the corporate uh, media world, mm -hmm. but we should also be critical towards each other and mm. towards our own ideas and thoughts. You know, there's an uncomfortable aspect of this insistence on irresolution, at least in my opinion. And this mm. would be maybe a criticism I have of Edward. He loved to popularize the notion of not being a joiner, that he didn't want to become a member of a political party. He, 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 he valued his independence. Uh, frankly, I think that that was a public mask and that he was behind the scenes very much involved in organizations and he was the joiner. But uh, putting that to the side, I think it's it's also the case that it's not really the best message politically to be disseminating to people mm -hmm. that the intellectual mm -hmm. can always be sort of involved in a an infinite quest without ever taking a firm position on anything, which is one way in which it can be understood. Yeah. But you know, there there are late essays which are on intransigence and taking a position. He says this right. This is an essay. And I think it's a very, very important move that he inserted, you know, into his oeuvre in order to clarify that that isn't really what he meant. You know, he's, he's probably, apart from the interview, which was his masterful genre, I think maybe the best uh, genre for him to communicate his ideas through, it would be the essay, right? Because he frankly thought that, um, you know, he wasn't really that good at writing a complete coherent and organically connected books. He he said to others that he really was better at like compiling note cards, you know, and uh, put, putting stitching uh, rather uh, uh, unpersuasively together these various fragments of ideas. Mm -hmm. So that's how he thought of himself. And, and, and maybe it's true. So the essay is maybe his his most uh, successful literary genre uh, in which he wrote. But the essay, what is the essay? The essay is an attempt, right? It, it is, uh, it raises questions, but it never brings things entirely to a resolution. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the kind of thing that he was trying to get at. Hmm. Right, yeah. So on defiance and taking positions. Yes, I, yes, I yes. remember yeah. that from Reflections on Exile, that last collection, mm -hmm. I think, of his. But um, actually, um, 
I want, I love those essays and you're so right that he was a master of that genre, but he's most famous in a way for a major work, um, Orientalism, that I think, you know, we have to talk at least a little bit about its legacy, its kind of controversies and reception and how it changed the field of not only literary studies, but well beyond as one of the most influential works, I think, from 1978. He published it, and um, so I was just wondering, uh, looking back on it, uh, you know, what do you think is the lasting impact of Orientalism and how it has changed literary studies? And what was his response? I remember he, uh, 20 years on from the publication, the Middle East Studies Association had a kind of panel to talk about the importance of this work and they invited Rashid Khalidi and um, Gabriel Pitterberg and some others and um, he was there for it and on the panel and after Rashid Khalidi said you know before you know there were all just these philolo philologists and you know it was a dead sort of you know approach and Edward Said said hang on I am a philologist you know and I, he defended it and so it just made me think it's such an important and enormous work that had such a huge impact. How did he respond or deal with the way in which it was being interpreted, debated, and so on? Right. I think I think for one thing, he probably he said more than once that he wished that he had probably done a little bit more research so that he hadn't opened himself up to some of the quite just uh, criticisms of what mistakes he made here and there. Um, I, I don't think that they were serious mistakes, but you know, it, it would have been better to cover his tracks just a little bit more than he did. He he wrote it um, in an, really kind of an outburst of passion over over a couple of years. Really, it's amazing mm -hmm. that the book was written the way it was written, um, and and how quickly, really, overall, it was written. Even though, of course, a lot of the earlier reading and ideas and and so on had been percolating for quite some time, but I think that. You know, the question as you ask it is related to the question of why even now, after all of these years, does Orientalism have the capacity to anger people and to get them excited on both sides of the question? And I think that there's a couple of answers there. I mean, one of them is that he is against all initial expectations, not condemnatory in any absolute sense of the philologists who are these Orientalists that he's referring to in the title. On the contrary, he really is admiring of their ability, even though they're bookworms and they're you know, locked in the libraries and, and working over obscure documents from the Middle Ages, that they somehow were able through the sheer panoply of their knowledge and their linguistic uh, expansiveness and skill to create this grand drama you know, of the imagination. And, and that, that somehow what these people represent to him, despite the flaws of some of them, because they're not all talked about in the same way. I mean, Ernst Renan is, is, is a villain, I would say, in some ways, um, like Edward Lane perhaps is also. But, you know, other people like uh, Massignon, you know, or, or, or Raymond Schwab are, are treated with, you know, admiration and, and awe even. Um, especially in some of the essays that were outtakes from Orientalism that came a little bit afterwards. So he's really saying, I want to learn from these people. I mean, I, I, first of all, they, unlike a lot of post-colonial studies scholars, they actually know foreign languages and they, they actually do know the case. You know, they really study it closely. But more than anything, it's like, how is it that a humanist and intellectual who is a scholar can write about serious material as a scholar and have a public impact? And, and that that is what he is saying they did. And so there's that aspect. I think the thing that angers a lot of people about the book, of course, is that it is in part a Roman a clef, right? It's not a Roman, but it's, 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 uh, it's talking about contemporary um, area studies specialists who've written about the Arab mind and who are, you know, like, like Bernard Lewis, but not only Lewis. I, mm -hmm. I mentioned others, right? There's Raphael Patai and, Patai, um, yeah. yeah, and, and uh, uh, Jehoshaphat Harkabi and, and others. So these people who emerge as, as racists and, and villains and uh, kind of, uh, you know, malicious 
inventors of an Arab type in Orientalism are obviously stand-ins for what continues to this day. That is, there isn't just an analogy being made. It's that these people still exist. There's a continuity between what was established in 19th century France and England and what these people are doing today. So I think a lot of people who read it understood that that's what was being said and it, mm -hmm. it infuriated them. Mm -hmm. The next thing, of course, is that Orientalism opened up a lot of doors. Uh, whatever the mechanism by which this happened is, everyone admits that after Orientalism was written, there were many more places in higher learning for people from the former colonies or people of color who were scholars. Um, there also were curricular changes that were brought about as a result of this. So hate or love Orientalism, Orientalism is responsible for a long-term sea change in the academy in, in a way that many of the conservatives uh, really, really you know, rejected and, and disliked. So, so this would be another reason why it's, it's so important. But finally, and, and this would be my last point, it's, it is not just about philologists. It is placing literary criticism at the center of the political discussion. It is saying that people who study literature for a living can actually have a profound impact on the politics of their respective countries. I mean, this is, this is, this drives the social studies people crazy. And it's the thing that they hate the most about the book and, and right. tirelessly attack. Mm -hmm. I think you make a wonderful case for the importance of that book. And uh, I want to come up the uh, Orientalism book from a, a slightly different angle. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that most people, if they're familiar with a, a single book by Edward Said, it would be Orientalism. And uh, I know I teach, for example, an intro to literary theory class, one of these horrible classes where, you know, if it's Tuesday, it must be structuralism. And, you know, I, I can only choose one thing by Said, and it's, it's excerpts from Orientalism. So with, with that kind of um, fact in mind, what would you say uh, people miss if they're only familiar with Orientalism? Um, to put the question a different way, what does a familiarity with some of Said's other works add to our overall appreciation uh, of his work and his legacy? There's many, there's many things to, uh, to say in response to that. It's a great question. Um, it's, it's related to a question I got in an earlier interview about, you know, if you only could take one book on a desert, you know, <laughs> right, that kind right. of thing. And, and I cheated by saying, you know, of course, I want the uh, collections, you know, I want, uh, you know, maybe reflections on exile, because then I can read not Edward in only one key, but in many keys. And that mm -hmm. is the Edward that I knew, right, who's always experimenting with genre and who wants to communicate to the public that he's not, never only operating in one key, that he's not just this angry black man who's always denouncing people polemically, that he, he has other sides, right? He writes about mm -hmm. music. He, okay, so, so that would be the, the kind of thing that I, I think would, yeah. So I would, I would tell people maybe in answer to your question, read the book of interviews that were put together. Um, you know, by Gauri Viswanathan, that collection of interviews, which is hardly, mm -hmm. hardly uh, exhaustive. It's some interviews, right. there's many others that are very interesting that didn't find their way in there. But you really get a sense, both of his ideas, the things that mattered to him the most, and also his manner of being in the world, because he is a conversationalist above and beyond all of that, mm -hmm. and was attracted to some of the people who he wrote about, like like Jonathan Swift, precisely on those grounds, that they they made speech the center of their writing. Same thing with his mm -hmm. love for the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. It's it's all about speaking to him, speaking over writing, which which you know, as you those of you who know literary theory would know that is is also uh, kind of antithetical to the major message that was being communicated to people in the seventies and eighties when he was writing mm -hmm. these things. Um, the only so so you know reflections on exile as as essays and then also so to page through that and 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 read the things that are in there that that might you know attract you or yeah. these interviews. The only other thing I would say and, and I'm saying it because it was a big revelation for me. I uh, didn't I must confess read all of his uh, 
writings for Arabic news sources until I wrote this biography. I, I, I assumed that, oh, you know, I know what he's going to say. It's, you know, he's, 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 he's kind of hammering away at the old themes and, and trying to attack from new angles what he's, you know, reiterated again and again. And although that, that perhaps is true, I am so impressed by the generic mixture and mm. the, uh, the, 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 the complete experimentalism that goes on in some of those. And some of them are these loving portraits of his son. And some of them are these popular cultural references. Some of them are straight Marxist an analysis of the political economy of the Middle East. I mean, it's a varied collection. So I'm thinking of, you know, the end of the peace process, for example, or the politics of dispossession. Mm -hmm. I think these would be over overlooked by a lot of people, and yeah. I, I would really recommend that people go go read through the whole thing, and you'll be, be impressed by his energy, but also by his versatility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of um, the clear themes, of course, maybe what you thought he would uh, be speaking about pretty exclusively in the Arab uh, press is, of course, politics and U.S. relationship to the Middle East, and of course, Palestine. Um, I was just interested a little bit in how you integrated and characterized his politics and his, you know, how he comes to be political. Usually it's thought of that it's with question of Palestine um, and that it comes almost out of nowhere. And you and your biography tried to embed it in some of his childhood and influences and family and so on. But I am interested um, in you know the question of Palestine, how and why he wrote that, and what circumstances, and also how it changed um, you know his life. Uh, I think um, I think it must have in in many ways. Right. Well, he conceived of the book along with the writing of Orientalism, which was originally thought he thought would originally be a, a rather slim volume on representations of the Arabs in the Middle East. You know, that's really how he began with that. He, he thought of it as a very short volume that would have an, a, an, an accompaniment, a, a companion volume uh, that would be more or less a, a primer, right? A kind of a chapbook or something that would just cover the basic facts of what is, you know, how Israel came to be, what is Zionism actually as an ideology, what were its origins, uh, what are the Palestinian claims to the territory? You know, those kinds of things. And so he set out to write, uh, you know, the question of Palestine with, with that in mind. He was more or less commissioned, actually, to write it by Beacon Press, which eventually turned it down on political grounds. Mm. Uh, wouldn't even give him the manuscript back. He, he, had, mm. he had to fight to get the manuscript returned to him. Wow. So I think that when the book... So, so actually, you read his correspondence, and after this very, very uh, disappointing, almost traumatic experience, uh, he said, I don't think I can try to beat my head against the wall for too long. I don't think I'm going to even try to publish this for another year, just so I can think about other things and not be so depressed about it. But mm -hmm. lo and behold, it, it gets picked up, and it, it, it is, in fact, published. And uh, he could never publish it in the Middle East because it was too critical of the Middle Eastern regimes. Mm -hmm. But it, it did appear here and it was an explosion. So he is thrust into a different kind of prominence as a result of writing this book. He gets a very, very, he gets large coverage in Time magazine. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a, a very, very interesting portrait of him that is a little, um, I don't know, underhanded in the sense that it's 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 praising him, uh -huh. but it's also saying that he's surreptitiously a member of the PLO and doesn't really admit it, that kind of thing. Right. So it, it leads to some of his first real hate mail, and it leads to a certain ostracism within the New York media world. It it isn't a blanket ostracism because in a way he is also the go-to person mm -hmm. for, so, so it's kind of this odd mixture that some places will shun him, uh, some places will say mean things about him, some, some will put reins on him and say, yeah, we want your stuff, but we, we don't want you to write about politics. So like the New York, uh, New York Magazine uh, on several occasions made that uh, clear to him. So this, this is maybe the effect that it had on him. Um, 
he seeks other venues to, to publish in. And I think this is why he's publishing more for the Village Voice and the Nation and eventually Harper's and, and so on, because as, as a result of publishing this. In regard to his politics, though, I mean, he really was political much earlier in his life. Um, and I think I, I do establish that in this book. It's, mm -hmm. it's commonly thought that it's it's the uh, Six Day War of 1967, which initiates the occupation of Palestinian land by Israel, uh, which continues to this day, um, that politicized him. But it's really, I don't think that's the case at all. He's, he's writing political essays as an undergraduate. He is very, very close to and very admiring of uh, communist intellectuals from Egypt and other parts. He, he's telling people when he's, you know, in um, high school, basically, in, uh, in, in, in the wilds of Massachusetts, you know, when he's first in this country, about his Palestinian identity and his, his anger about what's happening to his people. So his, his undergraduate essays show him exploring the politics of literature really, really uh, overtly, right? So he's drawn to didactic literature, Milton and Plato. And, you know, th this is what, this is, this is Edward. And, and he's also, I think, on, in regard to his politics, it isn't only that he becomes political earlier than people assume, but his politics are much more radical than mm -hmm. the politics that later he, for strategic reasons, or if you don't like him, you'd say for opportunistic reasons, he um, he hides, right? So he's very, very close to the PFLP. You know, he didn't ever join it, but you know, that is the far Marxist left of the Palestinian movement before the PLO really becomes the umbrella organization. So yeah, and uh, I think he's, he was always throughout his life very, very animated and felt very much at home around the most radical elements mm -hmm. in, in the Middle East. Well, so, I mean yeah, I mean, that's interesting because that's not usually how he's sort of portrayed. It's really something that happens later. And as you say, um, but, you know, what's also interesting to me is how um, he was very prescient, um, for example. Um, and I, this is where I think he took the most risks, really, in terms of his political interventions was after the Oslo peace accords were announced. He came out very early and adamantly that um, this wasn't going to, you know, be the right solution uh, and that it would have a number of problems of basically the occupation being, you know, uh, uh, continued just under a Palestinian uh, authority on behalf of Israel. And um, so that that political courage to make that break was also something that was maybe when you said that he was a lot more comfortable with radical, more radical politics than people may have anticipated. It's also the temper of that courage to really um, let loose. I mean, that must have been very difficult uh, at that time to criticize uh, Yasser Arafat, the PLO, and also was a time where there were so many public hopes that, oh, finally, we may have being a naysayer, which couldn't have been you know, an enjoyable position to be such a pessimist about it. No, I think it's very, very um, accurate of you and, and smart of you to put it that way, because we forget now, given what's happened in the intervening years, uh, that almost everybody on both sides of the issue were championing the Oslo Accords, at least at mm -hmm. the beginning. And even people were quite skeptical, like one of the major uh, negotiators, uh, Hanan Ashrawi, uh, a former I wouldn't say a former student of his, she was at a different school, she didn't study with him, but he was one of the readers of her dissertation, which is all about like, you know, a political kind of Brechtian literature in the Middle East, which is kind of interesting. Uh, that, you know, he supported that kind of you know, socialist realism. And, but uh, another side of him that isn't really uh, talked about that much. But so Hanan Ashrawi, who was one of the negotiators uh, and, and was absolutely appalled at the way that the Oslo Accords were achieved behind the backs of the major Palestinian negotiators and without any reference to any of the fallback positions, no negotiating, uh, hard, hard talk, nothing. It just was a complete cave uh, done diplomatically behind the scene and uh, then just forced on everyone else. So even Hanan Ashrawi publicly doesn't distance herself from it and attends the ceremony in Washington in support of it, later regretting that she did this. So, yeah, Edward's um, clarity on the issue, but also his bravery in doing it was uh, was something that we really can't uh, underestimate. I mean, it was 
it, it, his closest political associates, you know, uh, Sami Albana, who's very much more politically radical than Edward, and and a, 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 a kind of a stalwart uh, kind of organizer for the cause throughout his life, was telling him, "You cannot do this. If you do this, your name will be mud. You you will be completely os- You won't be a part of the discussion anymore." Mm. And he didn't listen. He went forward, mm-hmm. and he comes out looking now as being the, the, the principal voice of opposition and entirely justified by uh, the later uh, you know, reflections on what Oslo meant and what it did. Mm-hmm. None, of, none of the Palestinian demands were really recognized there. None of them, except for one, and that is the recognition of the PLO as the legitimate uh, representative of the Palestinian people. So it's, it's great for the PLO leaders. Now they get to say, hey, you know, but um, as he pointed out, basically they were being put in a position of policing the Palestinians themselves for 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 Israel. Mm-hmm. I think uh, when I was reading Places of Mind, and again during our conversation today, one of the things that I was struck by repeatedly was the sense that we were dealing with at least two Saeeds, and this may like reflect upon uh, what you were saying about his range and his versatility, but there was Saeed the traditionalist and Saeed the revolutionary, and I don't just mean that in terms of political commitments, but in terms of intellectual affiliations and so on and so forth. Do you think that's uh, an accurate way to sort of describe the combination of qualities that he and his work um, epitomize and if so you know, how does how does that combination show itself because you have Saeed the philologist on the one side and Saeed you know the uh, PFLP supporter on the other um, and I can think of other examples that demonstrate the same kind of combination. Right and, and this kind of in a way uh, alludes to the you know what you brought up earlier about the um, you know the epigraph that begins my biography exactly. about yeah. resolution and con- contradiction, you know, unresolved contradictions. Yep. And of yep. course, there are in all of us unresolved contradictions. And, and Edward, perhaps the, you know, the, the obvious ones are that he's, you know, conservatively dressed like an English gentleman, even though he grew mm. up and despised the British Empire. You know, he's 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 wealthy and privileged, and yet he's, you know, uh, he's saying these radical things that are applauded by those in power he's given awards for them you know it's like how does how does one pull that off but also how is it that you can look at a person like this and not accuse them of you know i don't know dissembling you know of of being something Mm. that they're not and i I think Mm. a, a lot of the naysayers when it comes to edward including some of his former radical friends you know, like uh, Sadiq al-Azam, right, a close friend, a, a Marxist from Syria, that they were very tight when he, during his politically formative years in Beirut in the early 1970s. You know, this is the, the, the conclusion that they draw about him. But I think that this is really a mi- missing the boat on him. Uh, the, 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 the conservative is, uh, in, in Edward, is a conservative that very often emphasized the importance of uh, traditions and the continuity of history. And if you think about that, it, it isn't so much um, a paradox as a kind of a dialectical uh, continuity that we're seeing here in the, in this, in the sense, right? That in an age of um, the kind of anarchic theoretical schools that want to uh, throw out everything that has to do with authority, Mm-hmm. And that want to uh, announce themselves as having enacted a, a radical break with all that went before. Um, you know, a Copernican revolution is the way that they 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 thought of it, right? Um, a- Edward saw uh, troubling uh, resemblances to, you know, the. Uh, raising of the political territories and the undoing of the social democratic traditions of American politics, such as they were mm. by the Reagan revolution in the early 1980s. Right. I mean, isn't it, isn't it rather, you know, the, the um, brave new world of the radical right was effacing all our connections to the past, right? Nothing was sacred, the way Marx talked about it in the Communist Manifesto, right? Everything can be revolutionized and turned on its head, destroy the past, let's invent anew. And he's pointing out, no, 
I mean, the whole point of his, his early book beginnings is that one can begin again, that one right. can, can mm -hmm. copy or imitate in, in an original way. And that we all are doing that. There is no new, we, we, you know, and this is an important point for him as a, a person from the Levant, as a person from the former colonies, as a person brought up in a British territory, this notion of can one be original while imitating? You know, yeah. you, can, you can see how that would be very, very uh, attractive to him as an idea, and it's one that he explores. So I think yeah. that Said is saying, look, we do not naively create ab nihilo. You know, we, we are always choosing who is in our constellation. You know, who, what people do I want to take my leads from? What kind of intellectual orbit do I want to occupy? And this is a conscious choice. And so I think that, that that's why he's emphasizing a tradition and conservatism yeah. and why, why the university, for example, you know, he's, he's talking about Cardinal Newman as, as, as people who he's invoking, right? I mean, people who are dyed in the wool racist imperialists, but who had a view of the university that he shared, which mm -hmm. is that it isn't a place for politicizing, but it's also not a place to create people who are useful to society. Mm -hmm, Forget mm -hmm. about creating people useful to society. This is a place to learn for learning's sake, where we ask new questions and imagine a different society. Mm -hmm. You know, so so he's very conservative when it comes to the university. It's kind of sacred space for him, and and um, th th that's I guess there's more to say, but I've gone on yeah. for too long. That's the I, kind of approach. Yeah, I think that this is one of the reasons I love that section of the book when you talk about um, Saeed's meeting Raymond Williams. Um, first of all, because apparently he was, you know, just a, a case of hero worship as far as Williams was concerned, but also because that, that just made so much sense to me. I see so many similarities between those two figures and two, and two thinkers. And, and also I would fold in people like E.B. Thompson, Eric Hobsbawm into that kind of conversation as well with that, you know, a fairly characteristic combination of tradition and revolutionary sentiments uh, at the same time. So that was, that was really striking to me. Very much. The very first class I ever took from him was on those figures. Mm. It, was on, wow. it was on the British, the British, the British new left, the British old left, really. The British, the British left who had made it big as scholars in various, but you know, so Christopher Hill, uh, E. P. Thompson's The Poverty of Theory, Raymond Williams, The Country and the okay. City. This, this is, yeah. you know, and Perry, Perry Anderson's reflections on, you know, considerations on Western Marxism. I mean. Th this he was very attuned to this so it wasn't only williams but just as you rightly i think uh suspected that entire constellation i that's just gone to number one on classes i wish i could have taken <laughs> it's now immediately the, the, the top of the list and yet just to develop this a little further also apparently he was a fan of um, action movies which i just love i know that's not something i would have suspected and i actually wanted to ask you a little bit about that about his attitude towards popular culture because this was an aspect of places of mind that i was not prepared for and was pleasantly surprised to to read about um how would you describe his attitude to popular culture was it adorno-esque distaste was it a guilty pleasure, what is it, a combination of the above or, or something more formative for him? It's a guilty pleasure and it uh, expressed itself in a number of ways. Uh, one thing that didn't make it into the book is that he was a huge fan of this show on Saturday afternoons called Dance Fever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, how could which, you not which, include that? <laughs> I should have really, I shouldn't I, I should have. I, I, I'm kicking myself that I didn't. I mean, because he, uh, and, and he was not shy about, you know, talking about the sexual moves of being very, very alluring and enticing to him. He was just his jaw would drop and, you know, he's sitting there with his daughter and his son and he's seeing this thing, but they, they all got a kick out of the fact that he loved it, but he would watch it religiously. Right. Um, so it isn't just here, here and then, you know, so um, his, his kids had a lot to do with turning him on to popular culture and making him feel a little uh, incomplete. For not knowing more about it, I don't think mm. that he ever really picked up their tastes per se. But you know, his son, for example, actually dislikes classical music intensely, and as was as a young boy, was much more into heavy metal. So he wouldn't pick up on that. But I think that um, you know, Edward was somebody who, for all of his bourgeois uh, upbringing and the continued bourgeois taste that he had, 
He also was in a kind of minor rebellion against some of the forms that that typically takes. So he didn't like fancy wines and he didn't like, you know, single malt scotches and he, he didn't like, you know, going, going to fancy restaurants. And I think that his love of going out to action movies partly had to do with, with that. Um, it partly had to do with a reprieve from serious thinking. You know, the last thing he needed at the end of a hard day was to go off and see, you know, like a, a Shakespeare performance that was done on film. And he just thought that that was insufferable. So <laughs> he loved to read Robert Ludlum novels. I mean, he, oh he was a big fan, a big fan of Robert Ludlum novels. Um, he, well, he'd get not even right. just Le Carre, you know, but Ludlum. <laughs> I know. Ludlum. Yeah. Well, that reminds me actually to ask a little bit about um, his engagement with Arabic uh, popular culture. Obviously, he grew up in an Arabic country, but, you know, his education and formation were, you know, in these Anglophone schools. And he developed such a love of high, you know, European or Western culture, music and and so on. And he rather famously, you know, in his out of place talks about the screeching of Um Kulthum and so on. But, um, you know, how would you characterize um, maybe in later in life, did he develop or engage with uh, Arabic popular culture uh, at all? What what um, what can you tell us about his engagement with an understanding of 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 uh, Arabic culture at that time? Well, honestly, I think that his knowledge of Arabic pop Arab popular culture was skin deep. And that insofar as he wrote about it, as he did in, you know, kind of the famous essay on Taya Carioca, um, it was, it was a, a one-off. I think it was an attempt on his part to sort of, first of all, introduce his Western audience to the kind of popular culture that was, you know, uh, well, popular, you know, that, that was representative of the part of the world that they would know very little about. I think he did it in order to also display his own range. But I, you know what I'm saying? Like he's very interested in not always coming across as somebody who is purely political all the time or right. only interested in literary theory. So um, his, his, his essays on music, for example, Western classical music show a completely different side of his character, one more uh, eager to indulge in aestheticism than he would as a literary critic, uh, one where he was not pulling his punches uh, when he disapproved of a performance, he just lets it all hang out and, and is much less tactful than he is in his own field. So, so part of part of that moving to a you know a, a figure like Ataya Carioca is with that in mind. Um, it's also a vehicle, though, for him to say that it isn't only um, the uh, uh, American government or the Israeli officials who are conservative uh, when it comes to. The Palestinian struggle, mm -hmm. but some of these uh, exalted figures like Taya Carioca in you know the Middle East are right wing in their sympathies, and it's really important to understand that a lot of these people are in fact right wing. That there's a significant impediment to our goals uh, that can be found within the Arab world itself, and that's one of the things that's on his mind when he's writing about Taya Carioca. Mm -hmm. But I really don't think that. Um, he knew much about it. In his record collection, and this didn't find its way into the biography either, there are in fact certain popular uh, performers of Arab music, which suggests to me that he at least was trying and he was listening to them. So Marcel Khalifa, for example, is somebody oh, okay. who yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he, he had records of. And so presumably he listened to them. Of course, the number of those kinds of things are dwarfed by the numbers of classical uh, records that he had, uh, Western classical records. So I really think he didn't know very much about it. He knew some, but it was more of a duty and um, it, it never really caught his attention or love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It sounds like in some ways his engagement with the Middle East was mostly through these intellectuals that he had affiliations like Sadat al Azam and others and through um, politics, his, his critical remarks about mm -hmm. Arab regimes and governments, but also, of course, on the Palestine question. Well, I think, I mean, the great, the great intellectuals of the Nada. I mean, you know, the, the kind of Nada intellectuals mm -hmm. and their and their legacy. I mean, he 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 systematically worked through their writings. I mean, he he apprenticed himself uh, to people like that. You know, Albert Hurani or right, uh, uh, Philip Hiti and uh, 
and people like that. He, he, he it, so it isn't just the the people who influenced him um, from the Arab world that were direct predecessors to his writing on Orientalism, right? Um, it's it's also these figures who who represent reason and you know uh, historical uh, thoroughness and uh, you know the the kind of a complete uh, knowledge both of the West and of the East that act as kind of interlocutors between the two, right? Mm -hmm. um, the reformation of ideas, the self-critical dimension of of the these uh, scholars. All of these things are enormously important to him, and he sees himself, I think, as in that lineage. So it is. So he's not just reading people who are from the Middle East who are of direct political concern, but I think he's he's seeing himself as part of an intellectual lineage that is Arab, and and that's how he wants to, you know, be formed. Right. Well. Um... You've been really generous with your time, and we've so enjoyed this conversation. Um, Absolutely. So perhaps, you know, I'll just ask, uh, you know, in summation, you know, what would you say are the enduring legacies um, of his uh, work in political and literary critical terms, um, having done this like major kind of reappraisal of his life and work? What do you think are the, the real key legacies? that he's bequeathed to us. Yes. Uh, first of all, I think that there are key legacies and that that's proven by the amount of interest there has been uh, in the biography. I was thrilled to see it. I wasn't uh, convinced that it would happen. I didn't know. I mean, he's been dead for 20 years. So I thought, how much does Edward still matter? And wow, <laughs> he still matters. I mean, uh, this book has been you know, reviewed everywhere, um, you know, and, and now it's going to the next phase of sort of like the more serious crossover journals and after it's gone through the likes of the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and all those kinds of places. So clearly there is this hunger for someone, like you were saying earlier, Adnan, of, of, uh, with the kind of, you know, eloquence and, and passion and patience and knowledge, right? Somebody, somebody who isn't writing out of vested interest, you know, somebody who is broad in their knowledge, who comes from the rather unthreatening field of literary studies, you know, mm -hmm. who's merely, you know, talking about things as, as, a, as an autodidact, you know, this kind of figure um, th that is so sorely missed, but particularly someone like him, who really was, in fact, an effective a counter to the arguments uh, and, and the performance and, and rhetorical abilities of the other side. He mm -hmm. could best them in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, often when he was outnumbered. And that is something that people cheered on and it's something that people felt empowered by. I know that it really felt in the years that I was studying and then as a young professor, it felt so much more uh, important to be you know, an intellectual in the university when he was around. Uh, than it did before or since. So that's one of his legacies. But I think that the major legacies are, are these. He did, in fact, change the conversation over Palestine and Israel. And he made anti-Zionist positions genuinely valid and uh, respected and even popular in, in, in many places. And that is something I think it's fair to say, at least in the US context, he single-handedly managed. Um, he did, in fact, there were other people as well, but he was perhaps the most important in, in altering the composition of, of the university, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, where the doors were thrown open for different kinds of scholars and new programs were created and new literary field, new, new intellectual fields were, were founded and, and so on. And I think that that is another enduring legacy. It's, it's a different university after he's there. But um, as, as you know from you know the the, the preface to my uh, my biography, I, I think that maybe the most important of all of his legacies is that he made the humanities uh, a dangerous in the best sense to to those in power, and he showed that people who were humanities intellectuals could actually have a have a stake in the conversation and could be effective uh, if they were turned outwards and 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 thought of themselves as being uh, people who 
not only knew, but could publicly express themselves in accessible ways. And, you know, who, who were clear about the division between um, what it is we want people in general to know and how important knowledge of a general sort is, but, but also that we have our political lives on the outside, not to mix those things together, not to proselytize in the university, but to, to hold on to the university as a cherished institution and to think of it not as a, as a refuge for professionalization, you know, but, but as a place that then can be left and go out from in order to do things that, that uh, you know, kind of represent our responsibility as, as intellectuals to uh, speak to power, but also to imagine different ways of being, right? To, to be critical, to say no, to be negative in the sense of imagining different worlds. And I think that he's really, you know, he, he, he eloquently laid out and personally represented the power of the intellectual to affect public discourse. And I think that that is the most important thing that he did. He brought the humanities to the center of political life. Well, thank you. It's been a fascinating discussion and it's a wonderful book. I really encourage uh, listeners to go uh, read it, uh, Places of Mind, A Life of Edward Said. Um, Timothy Brennan, it's a wonderful work and thank you so much for discussing it and discussing the remarkable life and thought of uh, one of the great intellectuals of our time, Edward Said. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. And listeners, uh, we also have to thank uh, David Schmidt for uh, guest co-hosting. It was a really wonderful opportunity to hear a literary scholar on the program. And this was a, a perfect opportunity to really uh, talk about uh, a, an amazing literary critic. So thank you, David, for joining us on The Munchless. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me.